Ron, thank you. So we're back this afternoon um, uh, with uh, uh, Ledge Council, uh, Damian Leonard, uh, and we are going to have a conversation about H270 as introduced. That is the uh, uh, labor that uh, doesn't want to open up. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, modernization to uh, uh, labor laws. So, um, I guess we'll start with general conversation. Does anyone have anything? We've done a run through on this, Damien, is that correct? Yeah, um, it? the chair wanted me to um, just kind of give folks a refresher on some of the points in there where there was more than a technical uh, amendment because a lot of it's technical, yep. um, but there are some sections where uh, there are some open questions um, that the committee probably needs to discuss whether they actually want to tackle uh, this session or, or address that at another time. Okay, so the mic is yours. Chip, I had my hand up. Oh, Chair, I'm sorry. Tol Tolino, I, I just was curious, this is Representative. I just was curious um, because I, I didn't see this as a walkthrough and I'm sorry, I, I'm misremembering us having a walkthrough on this bill. It, was there a date that I could be reminded of that this was introduced to us? Uh, yeah, there must be, uh, Ron, because I, I did the introduction and then um, Damien walked through the bill. I'm looking it up, just yeah. a second. Thanks, I, I did try to look back and the only thing I could find triggered to it in my attempt at search was today. So thank you. I actually, uh, I'm with you. I don't recall it either, <laughs> Barbara. I don't really recall a full walkthrough. No. Oh. So I, yeah, I did, I, I did do a walkthrough, but I think it was about two months ago. Um, oh. So it's been a while. Well, and, and I, uh, I have to be honest and just say that at this point in this day of this week, looking at a 22 page bill that we're supposed to like, I mean, it almost sounded like the, the chair wants us to wrap this up. And I'm like, okay, well, that means I'm done. I'm not touching it because that's way too much pressure. So I'm just putting that on the table. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Yeah. So, I mean, what, what might be helpful? Um, so Ron is saying it's, it was a month ago, March 16th. It feels like two months over here. Um, but what might be helpful is if I just highlight some things that are, uh, worth discussing rather than getting into the nitty gritty. Okay. Um, because I, I think there are some things are very, very technical and minor and other things have some, some implications behind them. Um, they could uh, have substantive impacts on, for example, the minimum wage or something like that um, by updating an exemption from the minimum wage um, or possibly need additional testimony from the committee so that um, it, it might be helpful at least there so that the committee can have a better sense of what's what's needed on this bill. I see Representative Hango's got her hand up. Yes. Yeah, I was, thank you. I was putting my hand up as you were saying March 16th. I didn't think to look back that far, um, but we did, we did get introduced to three bills that day. And I really don't think we did a line by line on it. No, I, I remember going very fast because we were pressed for time. Yeah, so, so my apologies that I didn't remember. And I guess I really don't remember much about it. And I kind of with, Representative Murphy, that it's been a long week and my brain is pretty full right now. <laughs> well, so um, I think the chair did want us to uh, to hear some, uh, I guess you would call them highlights from you, uh, Damien. So I think that's a good way to proceed at this point. And then I think uh, it's obvious that we need to uh, take a deeper dive uh, into this, into the meat of this bill. Um, but um, so I would be willing, we have about a half an hour only. So um, I would be willing to, uh, you know, hear what um, your recollections or your suggestions are, Damien, uh, to, in order to move forward. Thank you. Sure. 
Um, and I, I will try to use my most exciting Friday afternoon voice and try not to put you to sleep. So <laughs> I'm right there with you. It, I feel like this week has been very, very long. Um, so uh, I'm going to share my screen here uh, so that you can follow along with me and we'll kind of go from there. Um, so really, <laughs> uh, the first, sec first section here is in our payment of wages law. It's not the minimum wage law. Um, these are uh, technical changes in section one, um, cleaning up the language to make it more clear. Uh, in section two, again, we're still talking about just the requirement to pay wages. A lot of this is technical changes again. Um, but uh, let me just see here. Um, the, there are some changes in here that are substantive, and I'm just going to move through this with you. Um, so the, uh, the first here is on page four, lines 14 and 15. We're clarifying what kind of deposit account, and this is for payroll cards where employers pay people by payroll card. Um, really just something where you wanna make sure that um, I've, I've covered everything, not a, a major uh, decision point. Um, <clears throat> the strike through that I just skipped by is not a substantive change. It's just moved to later in the bill. Uh, in case anyone sees a big four lines of strike through and gets worried. A lot of this is renumbering in section two. Um, oh, and here on um, page seven, this would be a substantive change, although it's a fairly small one. Um, this basically requires that employers ensure that payroll card accounts provide one free written transaction history each month to employees rather than at the employee's request. So it would be the default rather than something the employee has to request. And then at the bottom of that section on page seven lines 20 and 21, um, the, it used to say, uh, and this is dating the law somewhat, that the employees could elect to receive the transaction history by email uh, we're saying by regular mail, email, or in another digital format to recognize that, you know, for example, I access a lot of my banking statements on my phone now. So um, things are changing quickly. Uh, okay. This language here is just the language that was moved above. It's regarding providing written copies of uh, disclosures. Um, but it's not changed from the underlying law, just moved. Uh, section three is getting into complaints for when an employer hasn't paid wages. Uh, this is a substant substantive change. Um, you would wanna hear from the Department of Labor on this. Uh, and this was a change like we did with the liquor control laws to reflect what actually happens um, in determinations regarding whether or not wages are due. So what happens here is you file a complaint of unpaid wages, the department investigates, and then they issue a determination as to whether you're actually due for the wages you claim you're due. Um, and so uh, it would provide to the prevailing party by regular mail and the other party by certified mail or service so that they would be guaranteed to receive it in, order, in um, time to appeal. Um, or if wages are due in an amount less than the amount claimed to both parties by certified mail or service. Uh, and this is their normal practice right now. This is just a reflection of that, um, but it may be something you wanna discuss with the department because their current practice uh, deviates slightly from the existing law in that if, the, if there's a clear prevailing party they don't do certified mail to both parties, I assume as a budgetary uh, issue because the prevailing party is unlikely to appeal. Um, uh, the rest of the changes in this section are technical. Um, 
The changes here are stylistic changes in the um, form here. And then um, some of this is clarification too, because the way the old language was written uh, for employees who were um, owners of or shareholders in a cooperative corporation, um, this is a section that prohibits employees being paid by debt. So if, if you think of the old fashioned sort of idea where the company would give you a voucher to spend at the company store kind of thing, uh, this prohibits that unless you're part of a cooperative corporation. Um, the old language said any shareholding employee, but you could have read that two ways, meaning any employee in the corporation who holds shares or alternatively, any shareholding employee in the corporation could request for another employee in the corporation. So this is just clarifying that it's actually the employee, but it, otherwise it's not a major change. Uh, let's see. Uh, the changes in the next section, which relates to assignment of wages um, are uh, technical. Um, and add some cross-references for clarity. Non-payment of wages, the changes in here are, uh, again, generally technical. We did strike the language and without good cause um, because neither myself nor the general counsel from the department, Dirk Anderson, could think of an instance when you could willfully uh, and knowingly violate the law uh, with good cause. Um, related to payment of wages. So, um, but perhaps there is an instance that we couldn't think of. Um, so uh, the next change down here also, a substantive change is clear, clarifying from civil penalty to administrative penalty. Um, as I've probably mentioned in the past, uh, an administrative penalty is one where the department issues it and then they can collect it on their own action. And it's only if the individual doesn't pay that they need to go to court. A civil penalty is a penalty where the department um, issues the penalty, but then needs to get the court to actually approve the amount of the penalty in a civil action. Um, so it's a lot harder for the department to enforce the law with a civil penalty. Uh, and typically our Department of Labor works through an administrative penalty and then if it's disputed, it goes to court, or if the individual doesn't pay it, it goes to court as part of a collection action, um, which is already provided in subsection C. So I think that was the intent. We used to not be very clear with the way we, um, with the way we phrase that, we would often use civil and administrative penalty interchangeably. All right, so now we're getting to the minimum wage section. Um, we are striking out the coverage language because it does what a definition should do. Um, and so we're just adding a definition of employer rather than having a section saying which employers are covered. Um, that way, anytime you refer to an employer, you're referring to an employer who's covered by the law and you don't have to say an employer covered by this subchapter or something like that. Um, so. And this actually brings us to probably one of the biggest decision points for the committee here. Uh, and it is these exemptions under employee. Um, some of these are issues that have been uh, raised in the past, um, particularly the exemption for employees in agriculture uh, and the exemption for um, secondary school students here. Uh, the secondary school student language here is updated to reflect the way the department has interpreted this section um, because regular vacation year uh, periods is not, um, is ambiguous. And so they deter, they interpret this in favor of the employee. So the regular vacation years are just those falling during the school year, not the summer break between school years. So this is something that the committee may want to clarify. Um, the other piece of this is the question of uh, whether the minimum wage exemptions for agriculture are um, 
too broad, should stay, so forth. And this has just been a point of discussion in past years. It's agriculture has a pretty complicated um, series of overlapping regulations with the federal government. And generally, if you're exempt from our minimum wage law, the next minimum wage law you look at is the federal minimum wage law, which covers some agricultural employees, but not all. Um, it's the subject of a report I'm working on for the legislature, uh, which I expect to have to you probably shortly after the session ends at this point, because it, it just has kept getting pushed back as uh, my workload has not allowed me to, to finish it. Um, but that's another issue that's come up. Uh, other questions here are um, the exemption for domestic service in or about a private home. Does that need to be clarified? Um, individuals employed by the US, we, we don't set wage laws for the federal government. Um, D here is uh, another one where this is uh, the way it's worded, an individual employed in the activities of a public supported nonprofit organization could apply to any number of nonprofit organizations that the state contracts with um, or provide support to to provide services. Uh, and the only exceptions here are laundry employees, nurses aides, or practical nurses. Looking back at the legislative history that's available uh, and talking with Dirk Anderson, neither of us can tell what this was originally intended to provide an exemption for. Our assumption is that it may have been related to some of the state supported nonprofit. Uh, hospitals or schools or institutions, some of which you have probably heard about in the context of the eugenics bill, um, because they were involved with some of that. Um, but we don't know if it may have been something else. Um, that was that is just a, a sort of guess based on what we could come up with is this may have been a public supported nonprofit. Um, you know, uh, institution of some sort that, for example, employed some of the residents or students or so forth at a sub minimum wage. I see there's a question from Representative Kalaki or a comment. Uh, thank you, Damien. Uh, this whole section, when was this last updated? Like what, what decade are we in when we're looking at this language? Well, if you don't mind coming along with me, I'm going okay. to I'll just I don't pull at all. up the section for you. Um, so if we look down here, the last update was April of 2006. I can't tell you off the top of my head what that update did. Um, but the first amendment was in 1959. Mm -hmm. um, and I would have to look back. My guess is that this was enacted, given that we say amended in 1959, this was probably enacted before the Green Books uh, came out. Um, and then it was amended, I think the Green Books were 1953. And so this was amended in 1959. And then you can see there's a handful of amendments uh, over the years. Um, and federally, and the minimum wage law came in? 1938. 38, okay. Yeah, so the federal minimum wage was 1938. Yeah. Vermont was, uh, I can't Thank remember you. how long after the feds we were. Um, but uh, yeah, we, it took us a while to adopt a minimum wage. And for a while, like many other states, uh, what we would do is adopt the federal minimum wage. And that was just to cover folks who were exempt from the federal minimum wage. Um, but very likely, uh, and from what I could see and what I remember from the statutory history I did on this, or legislative research, is the original language tracked a lot of the exemptions from the FLSA, such as the agricultural and domestic service exemptions. And um, a lot of states would do that to basically say, 
we want to cover people whose businesses are not covered by the FLSA, but we don't want to provide coverage to groups that Congress has determined shouldn't be covered by the minimum wage laws. Uh, the, the difficulty with that um, for a lot of states has been that Congress updates the FLSA a lot more frequently than states update the definitions for their minimum wage laws. Yeah. Uh, and so you, you end up with uh, things like subsection D here where uh, we don't remember why this was added. Uh, and I can't find it. I haven't been able to find a corollary uh, at the federal level. So I assume it was relating to a Vermont specific situation, but we just don't know uh, what that situation was 60 or 70 years ago at this point. Uh, and it might be might be possible to find out if you did uh, much deeper research and had a lot more time to dedicate to it. But with the resources uh, that I have and that the Department of Labor has, neither of us have been able to find anything in the records pointing to what that is. is but for. This, this 2006 language now in Vermont, is that incongruent now with federal minimum wage? Uh, we, we deviated from the federal minimum wage uh, a long time ago. Some of this okay. is matches up to federal minimum wage. Like I said, um, at least in broad strokes, um, the executive, administrative, and professional, agriculture, domestic service, um, home deliveries of newspapers, although the federal exemption um, is limited to... Um, uh, newspaper carriers, I believe, under 18. Um, and I, I do have a breakdown somewhere of sort of the federal and the state exemptions, and I can try to put that together in a side-by-side -side for the committee if I haven't already. Um, hey, thank you. Yeah, I'll make a note to do that. Um, so that gives you a sense of just of kind of what's there. Um, as we mentioned the last time, I think I walked through this to uh, Representative Howard has uh, a bill on E here, the bona fide executive administrative or professional employee relating to the salary basis. There is a federal salary basis. The question would just be whether you wanted to adopt a higher salary basis for the state. Um, so, and the salary basis is, is just basically, you look at two things. You look at the job duties that the person performs, and then you look at how much money they make. And the idea is basically that if you're performing this kind of work and you make above a certain wage, you shouldn't be subject to the minimum wage and overtime requirements. Um, and that's, you know, that's why someone uh, like me who would be considered a professional employee, um, I you know, my employers are not required to pay me overtime, um, although they could if they wanted to. But, uh, you know, um, let's see. Um, so beyond that, you know, there may be other questions on these exemptions. They just haven't been looked at in 15 years, um, or at least they haven't been amended in 15 years. So. They, may, they have definitely been looked at since then because there have been bills proposing to uh, alter or amend them over the years. Um, here's the added definition of employer on page 14, uh, line five. And then in line uh, number four here, it's just clean up. Uh, going to the minimum wage section, the strike through here is just getting minimum wages that have expired out of the statute. Um, it always frustrates me when you have to read through um, multiple sentences to get to the current minimum wage. Uh, so that kind of gives you a sense there. It's just getting some old language out. Um, and uh, the tipped wage here, uh, again, nothing new here. Um, the uh, Department of Labor defines hotel, motel, tourist place, restaurant industry as self-explanatory. Uh, the 
other change in here. The only change in here is just a technical change. Um, and then again, uh, in section three, uh, again, just a technical change. The reason these changes weren't made in the minimum wage bill uh, a couple years ago um, is that there was in the, the sort of push to get out a simplified bill uh, at that time, the, uh, the choice was made to just minimize changes uh, to the language so that the changes were the actual wage changes. Um, because as those of you who are here will remember, uh, this was a, a you know, negotiated change that got hung up at the end of one session and then uh, was moved out at the beginning of the following session last year. Um, and so the, the goal was to just get a very simple bill to the floor with a lot of things taken out of it that had been in the underlying minimum wage bills, uh, including some of the cleanup. So this is just doing technical cleanup to address changes that were made in that bill. The next piece here on subsection B, I'm saying that the committee wants to change any of this, but this is again an area where you may want to do a more substantive dive. These are the exemptions from the overtime laws. Uh, so employees of a retail or service establishment would be are currently exempt from overtime. Amusement and recreational establishments that are seasonal uh, or at least do the majority of their business in one season are exempt from overtime. Employees of hotel, motel, or restaurant um, and I see uh, Representative Palasek has raised his hand. Yes, can you go back to what you just said about the exemption for retail employees? Can you bring that back up? Because you yep. went real fast and I just want to take a look at that again. Sure, so uh, it's uh, any retail or service establishment, which is def defined as uh, an establishment for which 75% of the annual volume of sales of goods or services or both is not for resale and is recognized as a retail or service establishment in that particular industry. So uh, the key here is that, for example, a wholesaler, um, you know, their goods would be for resale um, versus uh, the, you know, um, the, the grocery store here in town. You know, I'm not buying groceries for resale. Those are for, um, for final use. Um, this is a, uh, you know, with this, um, like some of the other definitions here, the committee might want to take more testimony too on what the Department of Labor regulations are around this, um, whether this needs any tweaking to reflect <clears throat> modern realities or to clarify it. Um, did you have additional questions on that, Representative Palasek? Well, well, just, you know, and, and I apologize because my, my brain is kind of fried right now. Um, <clears throat> we, we, we have a Hannaford's in town. So let's just say that, you know, it's a retail store, supermarket, whatever. They sell products at retail. They have employees. If employees work in 12-hour days, is that employee going to get four hours overtime or not? Well, so there's kind of the law doesn't necessarily, the way I read this, uh, the state law doesn't require them to get overtime. However, those employees may have a contract with the store or the store may have an overtime policy in place. He's on. Oh, uh, Ron, you are uh, not muted. Um, so, uh, you know, to give you a sense of this, uh, when I was uh, quite a bit younger now, I, I worked for a retailer and they had an overtime pay policy. So uh, we earned overtime, um, but they weren't required to under the, the state law. Um, so they, they just happened to have that policy on the books for their stores across the country. Um, and it may have been that some states had an overtime requirement. And so they just implemented it across the board to avoid confusion uh, for their payroll, but this doesn't require it. Nothing prevents an employer from providing it. Um, and, uh, you know, as uh, 
as we all know too, I mean, if, if all of the other employers are offering it, it often becomes something that employers may offer. But um, this, like everything else here, because it's an exemption from the law and it hasn't been looked at in a while, it may be something you just wanna take a, a further look at um, because these are, these are fairly substantive kind of questions and um, just, it was one of those points that we had highlighted early on as a potential discussion point for modernizing here, whether any of these need to be updated or whether it's working and reflects current practices in the industry, or at least what we want to allow employers to make the decision on rather than mandating. Okay, thank you. Yep. Yeah, and then so, um, one thing that you'll see kind of consistently with a lot of um, exemptions from wage laws is uh, oftentimes uh, it's industries where they have um, uh, either uh, they, they may have a seasonal push, um, which requires a great deal of hours in a very short period of time. Um, but then uh, other port parts of the year, they may either be shut down or working at a very low ebb. So that's where the amusement and recreational establishments um, come from on this exemption. But again, it's a policy question the committee may want to consider is whether this still reflects uh, what's appropriate for the law. Uh, hotel, motel, and restaurants are also exempt from the overtime requirements under state law. Hospitals, public health centers, nursing homes, maternity homes, therapeutic community residences, and residential care homes, provided that the employees are paid on a biweekly basis. Um, and then the employer has to file an election to be governed by this section. So this, the employer has to opt into the exemption and then the employer does still have to pay time and a half for these employees, um, but it's on a work day or a biweekly basis instead of a 40 hour work week basis. Um, and that, that actually going back to representative Palisic's example is a, uh, just another thing to bring up. The requirement under law is in excess of 40 hours in a work week, not in excess of eight hours in a day. Um, so that, that's just something to keep in mind. You could work four 10 hour days and not get overtime. Um, or you could be, you could do a, a job that has 24 hour shifts where you're on the clock for 24 hours, take a couple days off and then you're on again for another 24 hours, but you'd only get eight hours of overtime at the end of that week. Um, <clears throat> yep. Um, so um, it's about 10 after, and uh, we'd like to wrap about 3.15. I have a standing appointment. and uh, Got it. So I'm going to leave these off at this point, um, but just want to highlight that this is a section um, that you may want to do a deeper dive on. Um, the uh, there are other questions in here too, such as uh, state and municipal employees, um, which are both partially, state employees are partially exempt from the overtime requirements um, and uh, municipal employees are uh, fully exempt. Um, and then uh, the, the other one here is, is um, truckers who are exempt under the FLSA too. Um, the next section relates to deductions. The only substantive change here was around uh, the, this is very old language dating back to when tips were something that uh, the state would determine whether they were deductible or not from an employee's um, uh, or determining what was the appropriate wage. We've our law has settled that, so this is just antiquated language. Um, the uh, next changes in here, um, the recommendation language um, dates back to the wage board, uh, which no longer exists and hasn't existed for over 40 years. 
uh, and the language in here was just updated to change wage board to commissioner. Again, we're getting out rid of the outdated gratuities language. Um, and uh, so the, the next sections here, 12 and 13, uh, these are both being repealed again. These are sections that date back to the wage board that were not repealed 30 years ago when the wage board statutes were repealed. Um, the uh, next change here is a change that we, these next two changes are just, they're not substantive. They're changes that we can make because we uh, made the employer a defined term. Uh, and that is bringing us to, again, here, uh, the same thing, updating, uh, getting rid of extraneous language, um, and then uh, adding in the language around administrative penalty instead of a fine, because a fine is typically a criminal thing. Um, and uh, clarifying then, just the language here that this is not a substantive change. It's just clarification. Uh, and again, clarification here in the next section. Section 17, uh, clarification of the language. There's a big strike through here, but we've just added a clarified version of it below. Um, and uh, the language in D um, is, again, a clarification of the process to reflect what actually happens. Um, and then the effective date. So really, the, the big changes here, um, or the big questions, are uh, around the exemptions from the minimum wage and the minimum wage and overtime, or excuse me, the overtime and the minimum wage and overtime laws. Um, some of those are antiquated. Some of those just, you know, might need to be dusted off um, to decide whether or not they need clarification um, or should just remain the way they are. Um, there are substantive changes around getting rid of the wage board and a few substantive changes just to update to reflect modern pay practices. Um, so probably the, the biggest discussion points are just those exemptions. Um, and that is it. I see Representative Hango has her hand up. Yes. I do, thank you. Um, I know that the chair was looking for some direction from us. So I think Representative Troiano, I think what we really should do because the first part is really just about technical changes and updating, we really should take a look from section seven on because that is all that minimum wage section. And we talked about that two years ago and we said, oh, we've got to get to that. We've got, we've got to look more deeply at that, especially with regards to the secondary school students and the agricultural workers and then some of those um, exemptions that we just didn't really understand. So I think that would be a great place to start and start taking testimony on it. I think that's right. I think we just spoke about agricultural workers and, um, and this piece just what the other day, um, just in passing. So uh, I agree. I think that that is probably what uh, we need to do. Um, and Ron, do we have, um, any anyone scheduled for uh, for this bill in the next week? Are you there, Ron? <laughs> yes, sir. I'm here. I'm sorry. I was on, I'm on the phone with the chair. Also, what did you oh, just okay. ask me? I had the volume turned down. What did you oh, just okay. ask me? Just if we had any, um, so if we were expecting any testimony on on this bill next week. Do we expect anything? That's exactly what the chair and I are talking about right now is time availability. Um, it's not currently scheduled, no, but. Um, by Damien that we speak with the Department of Labor on some of these issues that we encountered um, this afternoon. Okay. Yeah, Dirk, Dirk Anderson would be the person from the department probably to contact. 
And then I think they they like to have Amanda Wheeler, their legislative liaison, and and the commissioner looped in. Um, but you know, some of it's just kind of getting a sense from them what the existing practice is, and um, you know whether they have any concerns or feedback. Um, another thing too is just looking at the department's regulations on some of this, because you may be satisfied with some of those exemptions that their regulations provide all the clarification you need. Um, and that that's something where, again, a deeper dive on those issues could be helpful, um, particularly around like the retail question and so forth. I can't remember how much clarification they offer there. I know, I know they do offer some on, uh, for example, who's entitled to the tipped wage. Um, and so that that's often helpful when you're figuring out, do we need to actually do anything here or is this something we can just leave alone um, for now? And amusement workers, that was interesting. <laughs> yes, yeah, and some some of these all- um, uh, Heavy metal teachers. We don't have time for this next What comes to mind? Yep. Oh, Ron, we can hear the chair. Um, but uh, yeah, and I'll, I will send you that side by side. Um, or I'll try to send that early next week okay. um, so that you can kind of compare what the feds are doing to what we're doing um, and see if there are things that in some instances, the feds have updated their language and we may want to just draft a corresponding update or say as set forward in the Fair Labor Standards Act, um, or we may want to say, you know, Vermont should depart because our situation is different you know, than the broader country as a whole. Um, and that that's always kind of the, the policy questions that come into play there. You know, for example, the f one of the federal agricultural uh, pieces for the FLSA requires, uh, uh, it exempts uh, farms with under 500 man hours of labor in a quarter. And a man hour of labor is uh, at least one hour of labor on one day by one person. So quarter is about 90 days. So that means you've got uh, about six employees working over the quarter. If there may be a simpler way to say that, that works better for Vermont farms. And that also fits Vermont farms. Or maybe we just wanna say, we'll let Vermont farmers who are subject to the federal law be subject to the federal law and other farms be exempt. Yeah. So. Yes, and the term man hour is rather dated at this point. Um, so, but the you that, can put uh, your assistant on it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she's she's looking a little tired right now. She looks great. Yeah. <laughs> and and I have to respond to the man hour comment because um, I tried very hard a few years ago in technical language cleanup to remove the term airmen from. Uh, a different title of state statute and was unable to because it is technically a defined term that has to be used in that manner um, just yeah. because of the connection to federal laws and all those sorts of things. So we just have to understand that sometimes man means human, human. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, there, there are a lot of those things in here that, that could potentially use a little bit uh, more information. Um, and it, it might also be that the committee wants to tackle some of the easy stuff right away and put some of the other stuff off, or I, I don't know what the, even the situation with getting bills out in the next couple of weeks is, or whether the committee even has time to do that. So, um, well, that gives us a good focus on what we need to look at. Um, so, yeah. uh, I appreciate that. Great. I think we're going to call it a day. All right. And Damien, thank you. thank you for doing all the work on this bill. Yeah, thanks very much. Dave. Oh, it, it's my pleasure. I love cleaning this stuff up. It drives me nuts to find things me, in the statute. <laughs> me too. You, you know, there's like two sections of this that have been driving me crazy since before I even got in the building. Formally. Yeah. So. If, if anyone's looking for a, a drafting request for next year, you know, there are a couple of sections of Title 21 where we, you know, we say, uh, on and before like July 1, 1978, the following shall apply. On and before like so and such 1986, the following shall apply. 
And it was just these transition periods that no one's ever taken out of the books. And they just take up pages and pages. Um, Do you handle the so, illegal map uh, um, bill a number of years uh, ago? That, that was, um, Tucker actually was the one who did that when he was my law clerk. Oh, okay. Um, so, but oh. yeah. Yeah, that, that's another good one. Damien, when we do, when we start drafting bills for next year, let me know when you want to talk about putting that bill in. Anything I can do to make your life easier and clean up <laughs> unnecessary and superfluous language. Yeah. Well, I'm your just, man. just for the record here, I, I can't put this in, but I'm happy to do it for one of no, you. No, when we if discuss you putting bills issue. in, yeah, because you and I are going to, you know, like I have to, I have to confer with you. That's the process. Yes. Yeah. Uh, anytime after the session ends, feel free to shoot me an email or give me a call. Okay, okay, cool, cool. Yeah. The uh, stallion at large uh, statue as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've come across it three times. <laughs> All right. Friday All right. afternoon.